equal control. Both individuals got food in their cups. It was always the same quality and quantity of food. They could work together to pull it in. Capuchins are really, really good at this task, probably because it's fairly similar to some naturalistic sorts of tasks that they do. Um, they do a lot of reaching up to grab food and fruit and so forth, where they would reach up and grab the branch and pull it towards them and pull food off of it. So pulling something in to get food is very naturalistic and obvious to them. Um, I think this task also works really well because there's a lot of kinesthetic feedback on the task. If you and I are pulling in on this tray and you let go, it's instantly going to get heavier for me and I'm not going to be able to hang on to it. So it gives me a lot of kinesthetic feedback about your role. We also have a whole other line of work that looks at some of these tasks using computerized designs, which have some really, really major advantages. You can do a lot more with them. They're a lot better controlled. You can do some things that violate the rules of nature because you can do it on a computer screen. But one of the problems with them is that it's a lot harder to get the monkeys to understand that the individual sitting next to them is playing with them. Um, so what we try to do is do both so we can have the advantages of each. But this task is particularly nice. Um, the pro-social condition was exactly the same, except one of the monkeys didn't get food. So the idea was, are they willing to help their partner pull in so only their partner gets food? And then what happens afterwards? And the solo control was just like the pro-social control, except the counterweight was lowered so that this monkey could pull it in by her themselves. It was usually herself. Um, and then this bar was removed. So it was really obvious that they weren't helping. As a matter of fact, they couldn't help. Um, so the control for this, the reason why we had this control or why they had this control was to see whether or not this individual shared as much food as they did in this condition where they needed their partner's help. And indeed, what they found was that subjects were more likely to share food in, um, indicated in these purple bars after cooperative tasks than after the solo effort task. So, so capuchins do a fair amount of sharing. It should emphasize that this is what we often call passive sharing or sometimes called tolerated theft. It's I reach over and I take the food and you don't stop me. Um, so it's much more like if you're sitting at a lunch table with a group of friends and someone reaches over and grabs one of your Doritos off your plate and it would never occur to you to stop them because that just doesn't bother you. And much less like, here, have one of my Doritos. Um, they do do some active sharing, but it's not terribly common. Um, the size of the enclosure and where the foods are located means that the monkeys do have to take those foods and move towards the center partition for passive sharing to happen. So it's not like you can get trapped in the corner and your subject is just stealing your food and there's nothing you can do about it. Um, so we do know in some of these studies, they very carefully move away from their partner instead of towards them. Um, so they do seem to know to some degree that their partner may have helped. And then the next question was, do they actively coordinate? Do they really understand that their partner needs to be there? So for that task, they set it up exactly the same, used the probe social condition, except in this case, the partner, the individual who wasn't getting any food, could come and go back into the main enclosure as they wished. So the, they were not separated out from the social group, but they could wander back and forth. And the big question was, does the subject pull more when the partner is actually present here in the enclosure than when the partner is absent? And if the partner pulls, if the subject pulls more when the partner is sitting there, then that implies that they at least understand that the partner has to be there. Maybe they haven't quite made the leap to the partner has to be helping pull, but they at least understand that it doesn't work if the partner isn't there. And they did indeed pull far more often when the helper was in, again indicated in the purple bars, than when the helper was out. And they did so from the first trial. So it didn't seem to be something that they were learning across the course of the sessions. Either they'd already learned it or they just understood that their partner needed to be there. Um, they do pull at some rate anyway, which is probably because there's a big bar sticking into their enclosure and they pull on it. Um, we also have a couple of intriguing anecdotes. I'm going to play you another video. Um, this one, again, this is an anecdote, this isn't published, but this was a study where it was one of these tasks where the subject whose name was Star could come and go, and Bias was just um, in this portion of the enclosure. So you'll see Star and her unweaned infant, who was always, uh, unweaned infants are always allowed in the test with them, coming and going into the big part of their enclosure. And when they pull it in, Star reaches over and grabs her food before it catches, and Bias doesn't get hers. And so you can see what happens. So the food is put in the cups, star comes in, they pull. Actually, it was star's daughter that pulled, but anyway. Um, 
So they're sitting there eating the food. What you can't hear because I turned the volume off is that Bias is sitting here screaming, but notice she isn't pulling on the bar. She's sitting here crying and screaming, and eventually she starts to call. She gives a little pull and she calls. Sammy's just watching her while Sammy eats. Sammy watch, pulls it in, Sammy watches Bias, Bias grabs some food, and then Bias eats. What you also can't hear, there's actually a piece of apple left here, but Bias quits calling at this point. She eats her food and she doesn't try to get that last piece. So again, we see things like this that look like Bias understood that she needed Sammy's help, looks like Sammy understood that Bias needed her help, and looks like once Bias got most of the food, she was happy enough. Um, this tray was designed so that when it came in close enough, it would catch so that they could both get their foods, but particularly long-armed monkeys could reach out and grab it on its way in. So, you know, part of the problems with working with a really smart species is they're really smart. Um, so it's amazing some of the things they figure out how to get around. Um, they, um, one of the next things that they did was check to see whether or not they could do as well when they couldn't see their partner. So if they're just blindly pulling and happen to pull the tray in at the same time, and as a result get the food, then it shouldn't matter whether they can see their partner or not. If they don't understand that they are next to their partner and they're just pulling randomly, then it, they shouldn't need to see their partner. But if they are somehow visually coordinating on their partner, then it should make a difference if they can see their partner. So. They ran the same study. In this case, they did the mutual condition, so both of them were very, very motivated to pull. And they put in an opaque panel between the two monkeys, and they extended the opaque panel out past the edge because you can see the monkey's arms reaching out, so they wanted to make sure that they couldn't visually coordinate even on just, oh, the other monkey's reaching out. Um, and if you look at success rate when the partner was visible versus when it was obstructed, they do better when the partner was visible than they do when it was obstructed. They're still able to do reasonably well. Um, they're succeeding about 30% of the time when the partner is, um, when it's obstructed, but they don't do nearly as well. And if you look at the polls, it's much more uncoordinated. So it seems that they, that they are doing some active coordination. They seem to recognize that their partner needs to be there, and they seem to be doing some visual coordination with their partner as well. So the last question sort of harkened back to this first uh, study, which was whether or not they uh, were willing to, uh, whether or not they saw the rewards as something that were cooperatively cooperatively gathered enterprise. So in humans down to very young children, if individuals work together, they are much more likely to share food rewards at the other end than if they don't. So if you have really young kids who work together on something, they are really likely, you know, you give them five Skittles, they'll figure out how to divide them and they will often get rid of the fifth Skittle because there is no happy way to divide that up. Whereas if you look at, um, whereas if you just hand one of the kids five Skittles, they are extremely unlikely to share, at least if they're my children. So you need to, so one of the questions was whether these guys would do the same thing. So for this study, we did exactly the same thing with two differences. First was there was no partition at all between the two monkeys. So we weren't determining who got what rewards in this case. They came in and they pulled and they could presumably get the rewards in front of them. As you saw from that videotape a few minutes ago with Star, Sammy, and Bias, usually they just pull in and reach in and grab them. So they're far enough apart that it would be relatively difficult for them not to be able to get their own rewards. They're pretty easy to monopolize. Um, but we included two different conditions. One was the standard condition where the cups are right in front of the bar pole, so you pull it in and you can just reach out and grab it. And the second was what we called the clumped condition, where the rewards are clumped in the middle of the tray. So it's still two cups, and the rewards are still divided up by the experimenter between those two cups. I think it was two apple slices in each cup. Um, but they are now clumped together. So now you have to pull that tray in until it catches, and then you have to go to the middle, which means that if you are the subordinate monkey, you have to go stand close to the dominant monkey and hope that the dominant monkey isn't going to steal your, your rewards. And so we were curious whether or not this would influence their behavior. And it did pretty dramatically. We used mother-offspring pairs, which we considered our related pairs, and we used unrelated pairs. And what we found was for both kin and non-kin, they did much better in the standard condition than they did in the clumped condition. Um, Non-kin barely participated at all in the clumped condition. So this uh, is a su success rate down around 15%. 
um, whereas they were cooperating at over 80% in the standard conditions. So there was a really big drop off. And going back and looking at it trial by trial, the, this is just non-kin, not the kin. Um, that happened from the first trial. So it seems that they recognize that this is not necessarily going to go well from them. And of course, remember, we're testing them with members of their social group. They have probably literally millions of interactions with these guys. So it's not like they had to sit there and think out of nowhere what is going to happen. They were just, they were um, interpreting how this situation from the lens of what happens in their normal day-to-day -day lives. But they were applying their social knowledge of their partners to this novel situation and apparently deciding that this was a really bad idea, but from the first trial. So it wasn't like that they cooperated and didn't get their food and then decided not to. Um, the non-kin showed a similar pattern. They had cooperated at a higher rate um, in the clumped condition from the beginning, but it tailed off rather rapidly. In case you are wondering, it was about evenly split between mothers who took the food from their offspring and offspring who took the food from their mothers. So there wasn't a clear pattern there. So, it seems like these capuchin monkeys are aware of their partner, and they're aware that their partner is necessary. And they also seem to be aware that their partner is also in it for their own well-being and not necessarily for theirs. Um, so they seem to have the key under what I would consider to be the key, um, key issues that you need to understand cooperation under control. Um, and I so from here, we can start going forward and saying, okay, they seem to get cooperation. They seem to understand the contingencies of cooperation. Can we start looking more at whether or not um, they how they feel about some of these other situations? So one of the big questions that in humans, uh, that we have in humans is how do we feel when our partner gets more than us? So this harkens back to that last study. These guys weren't willing to cooperate in the clumped condition where their partner, where they presumably assumed that their partner would take all of the rewards. We don't know why that is, but as a human looking at that, I take one look at that and say, because you don't want to be the one who helps work for it. And then your partner gets more rewards than you do. That's not fair. Um, however, again, I am ascribing my own personal assumptions onto this. So we decided to look at this in other species. So when you look at humans, this is an example from Occupy Wall Street, which is probably now starting to get dated. I'll have to find a new photo. Um, but the, um, when we look at humans who are in situations where they feel like they're being treated unfairly, they look really upset. So we see animals in similar sorts of situations, like Bias, who was screaming because she didn't get her food, and she looks up upset as well. But the thing is, we can't just assume that she's see, um, feeling the same way that we do. We have to go in and look at that in more detail. So in order to do that, when I was a graduate student, um, I started looking at how capuchin monkeys responded to inequity. And for all of you graduate students in here, I uh, should mention that this was supposed to be part of my dissertation. And I proposed it as part of my dissertation looking at value perception in capuchin monkeys and chimpanzees and proposed my whole dissertation. And my committee said, that's lovely. There are two problems with your dissertation proposal. One is you have too much to do, which was probably true, actually. Um, and secondly, this last study looking at inequity, this is really ridiculous. I mean, there's no way it's going to do anything. You shouldn't bother. And half of my committee was convinced that it was totally obvious that, of course, they would care. And why would you bother to look at it? And the other half was totally convinced that, of course, they wouldn't care. So why would you bother to look at it? So they made me take it out of my dissertation proposal. And when I walked out, my graduate advisor looked down at me and said, well, of course, if your committee can't agree, of course you have to do it. So <laughs> I ended up doing it. And it was by far the best cited paper of anything I did for my dissertation. I don't think anybody else even knows what else was in my dissertation. Um, so don't just go off and chase something because you think it sounds great if you don't have some support. But sometimes there are good reasons to follow your instincts. Um, I did this after some of these other studies I just talked about had been published. So I thought there were good reasons to follow my instincts on this one. Um, so to do this, we set up a situation where two monkeys were sitting next to each other using the same enclosure as we used for the bar pole. And in this case, we, had, we needed them to do some sort of task and pay them. It turns out to be lucky that we decided to start with having them do a task. I did it because in my, um, when I was doing reading on the theory behind inequity aversion, it tended to be 
the, 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 the theoretical assumption was that individuals responded negatively to inequity because they were getting paid differently for some sort of outcome. So I decided we needed some sort of task. People then followed up on it simply handing rewards out to other individuals and they didn't find anything. And I have later done a whole series of controls I won't talk about where we simply handed rewards out to individuals with no task and we don't get anything either. So there are all sorts of possible answers. Um, some of them are really boring and prosaic and some of them may be because inequity is based on cooperation, um, but it seems to be that you need some sort of task. So I was glad I had, that's my second message for the graduate students, do your reading. Um, so I was glad that I had, uh, I was glad that I had included the task on that one. Um, we had a whole bunch of controls. I'm only gonna talk about three of the um, conditions today. We set the subjects up so there was a subject and a partner. We had an equity baseline condition. Both individuals traded and they both got a piece of cucumber. It was a quarter of a slice of cucumber. Importantly, cucumber is something that they actually like. So if I just walked into the room and started handing them cucumber pieces, they will happily eat 20 of them. They really do like cucumbers. So it can't be a food that they don't like because why would they work for a food that they don't like at all? That would be like telling somebody, if you come mow your lawn, I'll take money away from you. Or come mow my lawn, I'll take money away from you. That doesn't work. So it had to be something that they liked well enough. Then of course we had the inequity condition. In the inequity condition, the subject watched their partner exchange and get a grape, following which they exchanged and get the, yeah, got the cucumber. So the subject is still doing the same work for the same reward, but they're watching their partner get a more preferred reward. And for every individual who we test, we always do a food preference test, so they have to prefer what we consider to be the more preferred food over the lesser preferred food at least eight out of 10 times on two separate days um, in order for it to count as a more preferred food. Um, believe it or not, for most of our primates, it's actually been cucumber and grape, um, but not always. When we work with squirrel monkeys who are teeny tiny or marmosets who are even smaller, we can't use cucumbers and grapes because they can't eat more than two of them and we need at least 20 trials in a row. So we vary the food somewhat. Um, you can, in fact, cut a grape into 16 pieces, believe it or not. Um, so the, um, but there's one important control that I can't leave out even in this that has to be concluded, which is that in this condition, if the subject responds to the cucumber, it could be because their partner's getting the cucumber, I mean, it could be because their partner's getting the grape, or it could simply be because the grape is there. Um, so we put out the cucumber and the grape in all conditions. We have bowls of them sitting out, but they're, oops, but they're still having their attention drawn to it here in a way that they aren't in the previous one. Um, so in psychology, this is referred to as a contrast effect. If you see something and you want it, even if other individuals don't have it, um, you still may want it yourself. So we do what we call the contrast control or the equity plus grape condition. This one is particularly mean, so we sit out there with our grapes and our cucumbers, we wave the grape in front of the subject until they gesture towards it, which is how we know they saw it, put it back in the bowl, they do their trade, and then they get a cucumber. So in that condition, we know that they saw the grape. So we can control for the fact that we're drawing their attention to the grape. Um, as a matter of fact, if anything, we're actually biasing it, biasing it against ourselves because they're having the, their attention drawn to the grape twice for every two trials instead of just once for every two trials. But in that way, we have a control for, oh wait, I just really want that grape that you're holding out. Um, we've done a bunch of controls that indicate that showing them the food beforehand doesn't change their behavior. We've done a bunch of controls that indicate that the little time difference doesn't make a difference and so forth. So here's another video. I think this may actually be my last. Um, this is what the study actually looks like. Um, so here is, this is Malini Sushak, by the way, who's now a professor at Canisius College. Um, so this is Winter, who is going to be over here getting cucumbers. And this is Lance, who's going to be getting, uh, no, she's gonna be over here getting grapes, sorry. And this is Lance, who's gonna get a cucumber. So Lance first gets a cucumber. She's gonna happily eat it. Then win Winter's gonna get a grape. And then you'll see what happens. These are both females, by the way. So Lance gets her cucumber, she eats it. Winter is handing back grape skins because capuchins are very picky when they're in captivity and don't need to search for their food and they will not eat the skins. So she's happily eating her grape. We always use purple grapes to make sure there's a visual distinction. So here you go, Lance did her trade, took a bite of her cucumber and threw it back at Malini. Now you can see she's banging. Winter's happily eating another grape. <laughs> if 
In full disclosure, Lance is the only female who can do overhand throwing in our capuchin colony. <laughs> the rest of them just push it out or they do underhand throwing. So she makes a particularly, um, particularly good example here. But this is what it looks like. So they will see their partner get it and then suddenly they start to refuse it. And bear in mind, this is a within subjects test. So we know that under normal circumstances, Lance is perfectly happy to eat her cucumbers. As a matter of fact, you saw that on the first trial. So this is very evocative, but we have actual data. We've now run this on, we've published data three or four different times on data from these guys when they were at Yerkes, data from these guys at Georgia State, and also data from NIH. Um, and there have been other studies published from University of Georgia. And this is just one of those studies, but basically what you see is that the capuchin monkeys refuse their cucumber roughly twice as often when their partner gets a grape as compared to when they both get cucumbers or when you wave a grape in their face and then give them a cucumber. So they are more than happy to eat those cucumbers unless their partner gets something better. We see some individual variability here, but generally speaking in the capuchins, it's pretty consistent. Either everybody in the group responds, again, with some variability ranging between about 20% and 80% refusals, or nobody responds. Um, so you don't see a huge amount of individual variability, which is important to keep in mind because we do see that in the chimps, which is what I'm getting to next. Um, so, and I will mention the 10% refusals here you see at baseline are because these guys are indeed socially housed animals who are coming in and participating voluntarily. And if, oh, a hawk flies over the enclosure outside or the vet walks by or a female starts giving an estrus call or a copulation call, we have lost their attention altogether. Um, so we see a reasonably high number of uh, refusals even in the baseline conditions. We see a reasonably high number of refusals even in our great baseline conditions. Um, we next tested this at Yerkes at the, with their, uh, the two social groups of chimpanzees. And so I don't know if you can see, there are lots of chimpanzees in these pictures um, hanging out in their enclosure. So we tested it in two social groups at the field station, um, both of whom had approximately 20 to 24 members in the group, both of which were multi-male, multi-female, both of which had a decent demographic structure, some fairly young individuals up through some aged individuals. There was one big, and of course they were at the same facility, so they had the same enrichment and the same sorts of interactions. They interacted with the same people, same experimenter. The big difference between these two groups is that this group, um, which we call FS1, had been together for 30 years at the time that we did the study. So most of the individuals that we tested, all but one in fact, had been born and raised in this group. Um, and the exceptional uh, individual was the alpha female at the time. And Peony had been born in a different group, but had come into this group when she was quite young, I think three or four. Um, had, had, so she had grown up in the group. And she had been present when all the other individuals had been born. FS2 had been put together more recently, I think six or seven years before our study. And most of the adults hadn't known each other prior to coming together. So they had been together for quite some time, but they didn't have these very long-term deep relationships that you might expect in a typical chimpanzee group because they hadn't grown up together the way that you would expect chimps to do. Um, there was some anecdotal evidence that there might be differences between the groups. So Filippo Aureli had done some data showing that these guys were better at reconciling. Um, Franz had shown that there was more food sharing in this group and so forth. Um, so we didn't see any differences in anything big. There weren't more fights in this group or more injuries or anything. But just at this little level of sort of social, social behavior, it looked like this group might be more natural. So we decided to test pairs in both groups. Um, we also tested two pair house pairs. There were very, very few of them. So in full disclosure, these were the ones who were not, you know, it's hard to, it, these were the ones who were hard to get into a social group for whatever reason. But that is a very, very atypical situation for a chimpanzee who, yes, they live in fission fusion groups. So they do spend time in smaller groups, but they should also be spending time in larger groups as well. And so we wanted to see how being in these smaller groups would influence their social, social interactions. We only tested female-female and male-male pairs because these guys were cycling normally. The females were on IUDs, not hormonal birth control. Um, and so we know estrus changes behavior between males and females. So we stuck with female-female and male-male pairs just to rule that out for the time being. Um, looking at the data from what I call the short-term group, so that's this group up here who hadn't been housed together for very long, and the pair-housed pairs, you see big responses to inequity. Um, and to the contrast condition as compared to equity. 
Notice that the pair housed individuals are definitely responding more strongly to an equity than they are to the equity plus great condition. The short term group really isn't. Um, so we're seeing a difference as compared to the equity condition but not a huge difference as compared to the equity plus grape condition. There was some individual variation among the um, chimps though. So um, some of them were showing a stronger inequity response. The really the big thing was if you looked at the 10 individuals from the long-term group, they never responded to either of these. So this is 10 individuals and those are standard error bars. So we just didn't get refusals at all. So I went back into the literature and it turned out that in the social psychology literature, there was this um, hypothesis that was really in the sort of the social psychology and family literature that argued that individuals who were in really close relationships, so family relationships, successful marital or partner relationships and so forth, shouldn't be particularly sensitive to inequity. Whereas individuals who are in more contingent relationships, the person you work with down the hall, an acquaintance and so forth, should be hypersensitive to inequity. And there are all sorts of good reasons for this, but it occurred to us that that could be part of what we were seeing here. That maybe what was going on is these guys in the long-term group had these super well-established relationships, and it simply wasn't worth rocking the apple cart over a cucumber versus a grape. And so they weren't, um, and none of them were. And so we were interested in that, but of course, there also was a time difference here. Not only were they getting along better in some of these other measures, but they'd also been together for longer. So we couldn't disentangle how long they'd been housed together from how well they might or might not be getting along. So we needed to go in and look at that in more detail. So at that point, I had started working at the National Center for Chimpanzee Care, which is out in Bastrop, Texas. And they have a group of about 140 chimpanzees that have been socially housed since the uh, mid-70s. Um, so when the center was founded, it was originally founded as a biomedical center, but the founder, Michael Keeling, um, thought for ethical reasons that it was inappropriate to house even medical chimpanzees in individual cages. And so he put them in these big outdoor enclosures in the early 70s and refused to separate them out. So they had been living together in these great outdoor enclosures in typical family groups with age structure and with they were multi-male, multi-female since, since the early 70s. So they had grown up in these groups. So I had an opportunity to test the hypothesis by going lo and look at these chimpanzees who had a nice normal family structure and who were living in this fantastic environment, but had all been together for the same amount of time. So we could rule out that time difference and look just at whether or not there were differences in the groups. And there's very little data on this, but anyone who works with multiple groups of primates will tell you that we, I think anybody, we all feel that there are differences between the groups. I mean, groups have personalities, and that's actually something we're starting to look at with my capuchin groups, because we've got five of them. And some of them are more, some of them are more hyper, and some of them are more laid back, and some of them groom more, and some of them groom less. And so one of the big questions is whether that's driven by a dominant personality or whether it's just something about the the sort of interactions among the different personalities present, but for our purposes that was irrelevant. They'd at least been together for the same period of time. So we went out to Texas, we ran the same, we ran this exactly the same study on chimpanzees from six different social groups out there who all lived in these big corrals, so they had a very, very, very similar um, sort of history as the ones at Yerkes, and didn't find any differences across social groups at all. What we found in this case was a sex difference. So we found that the male chimpanzees at Bastrop were responding very strongly to inequity. And these guys were also only male, male, or female, female. Um, so we didn't have mixed sex pairs. The male chimpanzees were responding very strongly to inequity as compared to inequity and in particular the contrast condition. Whereas the female chimpanzees were responding very strongly to the contrast condition. And they didn't respond to inequity. I know that looks like it's an increase, but it's not statistically significant. Um, and that was curious, because we hadn't found anything like that at the Yerke, with the Yerkes data. So we went back and looked at it in more detail. Five out of six of the chimpanzees at Bastrop showed this pattern, and the sixth chimpanzee was a female named Pepper, whose data are in this graph, by the way, but she never refused anything at any point in time. Um, so really, we only had five subjects for all intents and purposes. Um, so five of the six chimpanzees showed this pattern. None of the chimpanzees at Yerkes in any of the social groups showed this pattern of refusing more in the contrast condition. They all showed either no effect at all or they were responding more in inequity. So clearly, it wasn't just about the social group, nor did I think it was just about the sex differences. So 
we did another study out at Bastrop. We took four social groups. And in this case, we tested every chimpanzee in the group with every other chimpanzee that they were willing to separate with voluntarily. Um, so for voluntary separation, what we do is we call them in together, ask them to come in and participate in the study. If they come in, they get the study. If they don't come in, we try again the next day. So we try 10, some days they just won't come in for various reasons. It's a beautiful day outside. They just had a fight. It's the first day it hasn't rained in two weeks, whatever, they won't come in. Um, so we try for 10 days. If they won't come in, then we moved on to the next partner in their partner, partner on their list, tried them, and then we went back and tried them one more time. So every partnership got three possible tries. Um, we had one chimpanzee out of those four who never came in at all to test. We had one social group where everybody tested with everybody else, and we had one social group where we got about half the pairs and everybody else fell in the middle. Um, so we were able to look more at, okay, how do your relationships influence your willingness to come in, or your willingness to come in for starters, and also your, will, uh, your refusals. Um, so we put all of this in a um, statistical model, which one of my colleagues did because that's not my forte, and we included not only their sex and their age and the sex and age of their partner, but we included how long they had lived together um, because at this point we were also including um, the Primate Foundation of Arizona had closed down and we had taken some of those chimps at uh, National Center for Chimpanzee Care and so some of them had not been in groups and so we had incorporated them into our social groups so we had different levels of um, different durations of relationship um, and we also had collected very very um, stringent data on relationships based on grooming um, proximity and contact and so we used a model we used a um, Joan Silk's um, sociality index for that. Um, we put all of those into the model, and what we found was that how long they had been together predicted who was willing to come in together. The longer they had been co-housed, the more willing they were to come in and test. This is not really very surprising. Um, and within that, what best predicted the, um, their refusals in the inequity condition was actually their personality. So at the time, I had a postdoc named Hani Freeman who had done her PhD with Sam Gosling. And as part of that, she had personality typed all these chimpanzees at um, Bastrop. And that had been done completely separately. And she said, can we throw this into the model? I'm curious. And it turned out that chimpanzees that were highly social with other chimpanzees, these are the gregarious chimpanzees who are spending lots of time in grooming clusters, were highly sensitive to inequity. And the chimpanzees that were high on metrics that had more to do with um, interactions with humans were highly sensitive to contrast. So probably what we saw earlier with the sex difference was just a, an artifact of a very small sample size. I mean, it was a huge sample size by chimpanzee standards, but it was a small sample size by normal people's standards. Um, and what we think is really going on is that there's something about personality and relationship that's interacting. We can't really say much about the relationship because unfortunately, of course, what we're really getting is just the data from individuals who have good relationships because we only do voluntary testing. Um, so one of the things that we're doing right now is repeating all of these studies on six social groups at Fast Drop where we have the entire social group out there and we just come interact with them at the fence. So anybody can come up and participate and we're hoping to get some of those pairs who maybe they don't like each other well enough to be willing to separate together, but they'll come up to the experimenter together. Um, so we'd be able to get some of those data as well. Um, the last thing, oh, I have some new data. So these data are not to be cited or repeated because they are really analyzed last night. Um, but we also started, <laughs> they could be wrong is what I'm trying to say. Um, but we decided to, to, to go back and look at some of these videotapes. So all of these data that I've shown you are based on whether or not they refuse the food reward or refuse to participate in the exchange. So did they come, did they flat out refuse to take the token? Did they refuse to give it back to us? Or did we try to give them the food reward and then they refused it? Taking a bite of it and throwing it back at us, by the way, like Lance did the first time, actually counts as accepting it. So we realized we're missing a lot of data. I mean, there could be situations where they are frustrated and changing their behavior that we're not catching because in order to be as objective as possible, it was just, did they accept it or not? Um, and in humans, there's been some great studies. Um, John Height's student um, 
Vanessa, I think it is, LeBeau did some work looking at kids and discovered that kids routinely accepted inequitable outcomes, but if you looked at their mean, it changed dramatically. They were more depressed, they were upset, and so we decided to go look at some of that with the, with the primates. And so we went, we have all of this stuff videotaped, so we've been going back and recoding all of the videotapes from the last 20 years, trying to see whether we can get differences in level of arousal from the videotapes. Obviously, this is not perfect. We would love to have skin conductance and you know, changes in hormone levels and so forth, but we have videotapes, so we can actually look at that. Um, and we only do non-invasive work, so we're not gonna be doing uh, single neuron recording or anything. So what we found is, if you look at these conditions, um, the partner is the light, the partner who's the one who, oh, the red didn't show up well, the partner's the one who gets the less preferred food is in the light gray, and the subject who's the one who always gets the better food is in dark gray. Among the chimpanzees, what we see is that in the trials where they accepted the, they exchanged the token and accepted the food, so these are trials that we counted as an acceptance, they are showing higher rates of arousal. This is things like rocking, erection, banging, um, vocalizations, and so forth. They're showing higher rates of arousal in the inequity condition than they are in the other two conditions, which might indicate that even when they're accepting the food, they're not real happy about it. They could still be frustrated. And of course, remember, they like cucumbers. So the only way to refuse in our previous studies was to actively give up something that they actually liked. And so that's a pretty high bar. Um, so this may actually be a good measure, and conveniently, it is, uh, it's consistent with what we're finding. We have no idea why the subjects are showing more agitation in the uh, equity condition. And I have only had those data since last night, so I'll have to think about them more before I speculate on that. But anyway, they, uh, they seem to be showing more agitation there. We also looked at the capuchins. Um, as with the chimpanzees, what we find is these partners are showing an elevated um, rate of arousal in the inequity condition as compared to the food control and the equity test condition. So they do seem to be more aroused. Interestingly, the subjects are more aroused in both the food control and the inequity test than they were in the equity condition. So that might indicate that even for the subjects who are getting the better reward, um, they find it frustrating, irritating, arousing, agitating, whatever. We, we don't know. I mean, all I can tell you is they're showing higher rates of arousal when you've got these grapes there that their partner isn't getting or that they aren't able to get. Um, what these data really tell me is we need to start figuring out how to do some more work looking at things like uh, uh, skin conductance and so forth. Not that anyone's figured out how to do that with a species that urine washes, um, but we're working on that. So the last thing, oh, uh, I have two last things I want to talk about and I have five minutes. So um, the, one of the things that's really interesting is, uh, from, to me, is how inequity influences cooperation. So I've, I've started by talking about all these studies on cooperation, particularly with capuchins, showing that they do cooperate. And then I spent a lot of time talking about um, how individuals respond to inequity, and I made the case that this inequity had to do with cooperation. But the studies that you were looking at weren't actually cooperation tasks. They were doing the same task next to one another and getting paid differently, but they weren't working together. Um, so one of the things we've done is looking, looked at how they respond when they do work together and get paid differently. So for that, we went back to the bar pool. Um, and in this case, we used the bar pole with a, um, in the mutual condition where they both get food. We did not put a barrier between. So the individuals are deciding who's pulling on which side and which food they're getting. But in this case, instead of the foods being the same, in two conditions they were. They either both got apple or they both got grape. And in one condition, they were different. One got apple and one got grape. Um, in case you were wondering why we did not use cucumber, it turned out that cucumber is a lovely food, but not sufficiently good to get them to bar pull for it on a regular basis. So we moved up to apple, and we actually had a smaller sample size for this study because we a priori threw out anybody who didn't pass the, um, the, our food preference test for the apple and the grape. So we know for a fact that everybody who participated in this study prefers grape over the quantity of apples that we used um, at least eight out of ten times on two separate days. So we used related and unrelated pairs. And what we found was, this is a busy graph, but the take home message is across all three of these conditions, both related in green and unrelated in pink pairs were, they came up and they watched us put the food in and somebody would give a pull on the bar, 
but if you looked at success rates, what we were expecting was success rates to be lower in this one, the apple grape condition where the foods are unequal. But instead, what we got was that related pairs pull better than unrelated pairs, which is not exactly news. We, we assume that. Um, but we didn't get any differences across the conditions. However, when we went back and we looked at the data secondarily, what we realized was within both kin pairs and non-kin pairs, although these data are only for the non-kin pairs, we had a bimodal split in the data, whereas where in that apple grape condition, so now talking only about the condition where one pulls for apple and one pulls for grape, in about half the pairs, the, the two individuals equally often took the grape. About 53% of the time, the dominant got the grape, and the other 47% of the time, the subordinate got the grape. So they were roughly evenly splitting who got the grape. And in the other pairs, the dominant more or less always took the grape. So you've got these partnerships where the dominant does better, and you've got these partnerships where the, they're, they do equally well. And if you look at cooperation across that split, you see that individuals in inequitable, in equitable pairs are cooperating 75% of the time, and individuals in inequitable pairs are cooperating 30% of the time. So it seems like these guys aren't having a problem with an unequal split of the rewards per se. They're having a problem with a partner who isn't dealing with it well. So what this may indicate is that what's really important is the partner's behavior and not the rewards. So it's okay to get a less than your partner in the short term as long as over the long term things even out. And of course, that's how we do things. I mean, I'd lend you money for a Coke and then you'd give me money for a Coke later. And over the short term, we both, one of us is at a deficit and over the long term, we both do better off. Um, so you really can't have a successful cooperative system without something like that. Um, but we didn't expect to see that in the conclusions. So the last, the, really the last thing I want to talk about um, is whether or not primates know how their partners feel about them. So I've spent a lot of time talking about how they feel about their partners, but does this guy here, Winter, who's getting the grape, know how Lance feels about her as she gets the cucumber? And I swear I'm finishing. <laughs> so to do that, we did the reverse of the regular inequity test. Um, we included an equity high value test where they both got great. And, they, uh, and what we looked at was how the partner, in this case the one who got the great, responded to their grape when the subject also got the great versus when the subject got the cucumber. So this is how do you respond when you're over-benefited. The short version is most species don't care. They respond, the partner responds to the grape the same regardless. In chimpanzees, you actually see that subjects respond more strongly to the grape when their partner gets a cucumber than when their partner also gets a grape. They're more likely to refuse, about twice as often, which is probably biologically relevant. Um, I will say this is the same subject's response when they get the cucumber and their partner gets the grape. So they're much more upset by being treated unfairly by being treated dis by being disadvantaged than they are by being advantaged um, but they seem to notice and indeed humans do the same thing so this is that lovely study by Peter Blake and Katie McAuliffe and their colleagues looking at kids from the age of four to 15 across seven different societies including Canada here in gray and the U.S. here in pink and they find that kids never refuse in an equity condition and refuse a lot when they're being disadvantaged and that that increases with age but that kids from most cultures do not refuse when they're being advantaged. And even in the cultures where, where they do, which is Canada, the US, and weirdly Uganda, which they don't explain in the paper, um, it, uh, they do refuse, but it doesn't increase as fast as the disadvantaged responses, nor does it ever get as high. And there are good reasons to evolve a sense of what your partner is feeling. So obviously it makes sense to respond when you're disadvantaged. If I am getting less than you, then that tells me that it's time to go find a new partner. Perhaps if I am not doing well with you, I should go cooperate with Alex, who might treat me better. He might not, but I probably have nothing to lose, so it's worth trying it out. Um, this is, I would, argue, I would expect, I would hypothesize that this is probably widespread across the animal kingdom. I see no reason why it wouldn't be, because this is, it seems like a very obvious proximate mechanism to help individuals maximize their partner choice options. Um, you probably wouldn't find it in situations where there aren't partner choice options. For instance, if you're in a situation where there aren't any opportunities to go find a new social partner. Um, 
This, but then this, what we call second order inequity aversion would be when you're advantaged. So let's say that I'm getting the cucumber and you're getting the grape. You recognize that I'm going to get upset about this and go participate with Alex. And you like the fact that we're working together because in the long run it benefits you. So you might do something to try and forestall my protest. Um, you might give me a chance to get the grape. You might share a little bit. Do something with me to make me not be so upset. And if you do a good job, then I'll stay put. So you pay a short-term cost because you recognize that I was likely to be feeling disadvantaged. And if it keeps me in the relationship and benefits you over the long term, then there are some real advantages to you for doing so. We see this in humans. We might see this in chimps. There's a little bit of evidence now. Um, we, I would hypothesize that we might see it in dolphins or elephants or other long-lived social species, but I doubt this is particularly widespread simply because it requires so much in, the, in terms of planning and um, um, under, in recognizing individuals and so forth. So in general, primates appear to know that they need their partners. They appear to know that their partner's interests differ from theirs. They get frustrated when their partner gets more than them. And chimpanzees at least recognize when they get more. And I would hypothesize that these feelings, if they exist, which I think they do, are probably proximate mechanisms that let animals maximize their partner choice mechanisms. So figure out when it's time to go find a new cooperative partner, figure out when it's time to get out of this cooperative relationship that benefit them in the long run. I would like to thank you. Um, and also all of this work takes an awful lot of people. So I would particularly like to thank all of my students and postdocs and undergrads who've worked with me over the last few years. Thank you. So I can't help but to wonder if those videos you just showed earlier about the, the data that you gathered yesterday might have something to do with that last explanation, right? Because at least as a human, if I see my long-term friend getting nothing and I get something, I might be at the very least worried that then they're going to dislike me and then I might lose my friend. So perhaps this arousal, arousal might have to do with some anxiety over losing some, well, you might have thought about it already. <laughs> no, I totally agree with you. Um, there is a big discussion in the primate literature about whether we can call them friends, but I would argue that a long-term cooperative partner could be called a friend. Um, and I think that in humans, probably our long, we have more long-term cooperative partners and probably are more interdependent on them. Certainly in some respects we are. Um, and I think that's exactly what's going on. My suspicion is that what we're seeing is the basis it, we're seeing in non-human animals a basic response that in humans has developed more fully and has extended beyond just simple cooperative things like are you hunting together um, into these really tight friendship relationships. So yeah, I think that's exactly what's going on. And I think in humans, that's what a lot of these emotions probably do as well. They may do more things than that, um, but I agree with you. Um, I was wondering if you uh, tried looking uh, whether the the difference, uh, well, the, the dominant status difference between the partners had an effect on the cooperation in capuchin monkeys with uh, with the counterweight uh, clumped experiment, whether uh, fully dominant male with another subordinate, like at the really the bottom of the hierarchy, would would uh, cooperate compared to uh, two next to each other in the dominant hierarchy. Great question. So to some degree, that's hard to say because a lot of these studies have pretty small sample sizes, um, usually 10 or 12 individuals. We surprisingly don't find that. In most of these studies, the dominant individuals are willing to work with subordinate individuals. And even more surprisingly, they're often willing to work with the beta male, um, which if anything, you would suspect that they would be least likely to want to work with that individual who is sort of their next competition. Um, in the inequity day responses data, I have more evidence for that simply because our sample sizes are larger, um, because we're looking at individuals instead of at the pair. We don't see evidence for dominance relationships affecting it in a, many, many, many of the studies, including in capuchins. Um, in chimpanzees, we do see evidence for dominance relationships, and it's exactly as you'd uh, expect. More dominant individuals are more upset by being disadvantaged. Um, but it doesn't appear all of the time. Um, so 
it, it's not clear whether it's because of the study or because of our sample sizes or because we're not met, because dominance, we use dominance in a very rough way. You're either the alpha male or you're high ranking or you're not. And so it may be that it's more subtle than that. Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, my question was, um, is it possible to observe if the non-human uh, primates store in their uh, memory their, the feeling that resulted from the interaction, the social interaction with each other? For example, in that uh, segment with bias when she doesn't get her share of food, where if the uh, experiment was uh, repeated the next day, but the other way around with the same partner uh, would bias help her partner or maybe hold a grudge against them? <laughs> It's a great question. So that one was, it wasn't supposed to happen the way that it did. They were both supposed to get their food. Um, so one of the problems with a lot of the studies like that is that, you know, we get these video clips that are anecdotal simply because it wasn't intended to happen that way. Um, I don't have a great answer for that question, in part because we try not to do things that could disrupt the social relationships because they live in a long-term social group and my primary goal is not to disrupt that. Um, so there's some studies that we simply can't do. We do have some evidence in other um, situations. So there was a great study by Franz de Waal looking at chimpanzees where he looked at whether or not grooming in the morning influenced food sharing in the afternoon. And he found that it did. Um, and individuals who groomed each other in the morning, so if A groomed B in the morning, then B was more likely to share food with A in the afternoon. But A was no more likely to share food. Um, and it wasn't a generalized effect. But what was particularly interesting was the, infect, the effect was enhanced for individuals who didn't typically groom. So if you and I groom all the time and I groom you in the morning, you're not, you'll share, you might share a little more with me. But if I rarely groom Alex and I groom him in the morning, then he's much more likely to share with me in the afternoon, which gets at that question that I think you're asking, which is that, yeah, they, they do seem to have some long-term memory for that that seems to be very, much more specific to the situation than just a generalized um, oh, I remember you and I like you. That being said, most of the evidence that we have for reciprocity, which involves at least a component of memory, seems to be for attitude, what we would call attitudinal reciprocity. So it's not, I remember that you did X for me and now I owe you Y, but more, oh, I remember that you helped me and I like you, so I'm gonna help you. So it's contingent, but not terribly specific, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, I find this work really interesting because a while since I, I touched on the literature, I, I recall like when the original paper came out in 2003, there was a lot of uh, controversy over it and there was these kind of frustration explanations and expectation explanations, but I, to be honest, I've not kept up. So could you kind of comment on where the literature has gone since then and those, because those, those, those alternative explanations and how that's been, uh, that's been addressed? Yeah, I think a lot of that originally was... <laughs> I mean, I thoroughly agree that they're frustrated. So really the question is to what were they frustrated over? Um, and so I suspect that the underlying mechanism for these inequity responses is the same that you see in a contrast effect. It's just that they're frustrated over something that their partner got rather than over something that they saw in the environment or something that happened to them earlier. So a couple of the papers that came out immediately after the 2003 paper were those papers that I mentioned earlier that didn't use up, um, didn't have any sort of a task. And so the ones that don't use a task, you never find anything, including in my own work. So we have replicated a lot of those with no task. And it seems to be important. Um, it's not clear whether it's just prosaically because these guys are all socially housed and used to working with humans and they're used to being fed. And so if you walk up and give them food, it doesn't really trigger anything or whether it's because inequity really is something that's specific to this sort of working context. And so you need to be working together or working next to another individual to trigger it. Um, one of the other things that has also become really clear with the chimpanzees, at least, is that there's an enormous amount of variability within the chimpanzees. So most, I only know of one study with capuchin monkeys that hasn't found a response to inequity that did include a task. So I think with capuchins, most people agree at this point that, yeah, there's got to be something there and that, you know, maybe different situations trigger it differently. With the chimpanzees, it seems to be based on whether or not, um, it's, it seems to be based on whether or not there's a task. And also, they seem to be sensitive to the social condition. So, for instance, chimpanzees who are sitting across from each other don't seem to respond the same as chimps who are sitting next to each other. So, um, a lot of the work that came out of Germany, they, the way... 
the way theirs is set up and with chimpanzees, you can't just move chimps around the way you want because they're big and strong and so you can't just plop them down where you need them to be. Um, they had built their experimental chamber so that the chimps are sitting across from one another across about a one meter wide barrier. Um, so the, inter the experimenter would interact with one and then turn around and interact with the other and then turn around and interact with, back with the first. Um, and in hours, the chimpanzees are sitting next to one another in the same enclosure, literally touching shoulders. And so one of the hypotheses was that when, in humans at least, when you're sitting across from each other, it triggers different sort of reactions than sitting next to each other. And a recent paper, I cannot remember the student's name, um, within the last six months or so came out of there showing that, yeah, when you put the chimps next to each other, they get more of a response too. Um, so I, I, think it's, it, I think the general consensus now is that, yes, it is frustration, but it's fr and I would, would have agreed with that in the first place, um, but it's frustration over, um, frustration over what somebody else got rather than frustration, sort of a generalized frustration over, oh, you held up a reward that I wanted and so forth. Um, a lot of the earlier studies too didn't compare responses across the different conditions, so it was really hard to judge. You're welcome. We have time for one more. Thank you. What would happen if uh, instead of two monkeys, you would put a monkey and a human? Yeah, that's a great question. And I get asked that a lot. We haven't done it partially because they have a weird relationship with us. So we are omniscient and omnipotent to them. We show up, we bring them food. We are the ones who control a lot of stuff. Um, in our situation, it's a little less like that because our guys, like I said, are all socially housed and everything is voluntary. We are actually talking about doing that, though, in part because I would really like to do some controlled studies where we have an individual who is trained to behave one way or the other. And it is easy to train a non-human primate stooge to always behave in one fashion, but it is very difficult to train them to be contingent. Uh, so you can't train a chimpanzee to do tit-for-tat responses, for instance. Um, I'm not 100% certain. It's not clear to me whether they would see us as a social partner or whether they would get more angry at us because we're supposed to be helping them or whether we're just so irrelevant to them that they wouldn't pay much attention to us at all. Would they cooperate? Yeah, they will cooperate with humans, especially the chimpanzees. Um, the chimpanzees, I think, chimpanzees definitely under, chimpanzees, I'm, I'm moving way outside the data. Working with chimpanzees, it's very clear that chimpanzees see us as another individual like they are. Um, they're much more interested in engaging with us. Um, the chimps in Texas who I lived with, I lived out there for years and I don't anymore because I'm based in Georgia and I have three kids and just can't be out there all the time. Um, when I go out there, the chimps I worked with all the time come running up to see me. They want to interact. They remember me. Capuchins do. Um, when we've gotten some of our social groups of capuchins who I hadn't seen in a few years when, um, at, when they came over from Yerkes, they would recognize me and as evidenced by the fact that they would take food from me and no one else because they were scared out of their minds because they'd just been transferred across over 10 miles. Um, but it's not the same sort of thing. So I think with the chimpanzees, you'd be more likely to get something interesting, whereas I don't think the capuchins see us in the same way. I was wondering if they could get... I was wondering if they would get upset if they get the reward and you don't, they would get as agitated. I kind of doubt it. <laughs> I think they would be most likely to get upset if we got the reward and they didn't. Because I think they see it as our job to, uh, to give them rewards. Because that's what we normally do. <laughs> okay, so at this point, we're going to welcome... Thanks so much, Sarah. That's fabulous research. You have given me so much uh, pleasure and so much to work with teaching your work to my students and discussing it in my own work. And it's such a rich area of research. So thank you for, for all you do. <laughs> um, I'm really interested in the relationship between this work on cooperation and inequity avoidance and normativity and normative thinking and proto-morality. 
And so one of the things that as a philosopher I'm interested in doing, of course, is looking at what these concepts are that we're using. So what is cooperation? What is fairness? What is inequity? When we use these sorts of normative words, what are the assumptions behind the words that we're using? There's a lot of debate, as I understand it still, among primatologists about whether great apes do cooperate. And um, I think that the sort of evidence we see coming out of North America is that the great apes are cooperating. In Japan, the great apes are cooperating. It might just be European apes are just not as uh, good at cooperating as us. Um, but then, then the, the other word that I'm really interested in, fairness. Fairness is such an interesting term because what does fairness presuppose? Well, we talk about fairness as if it, it presupposes um, equal distribution of resources, right? Inequity avoidances. You get exactly the same thing I get. But in human culture, fairness isn't exact same distribution, equal distribution of resources, because we have some kind of weird quasi um, uh, like Marxian views, I think, that we need different things. And so if you don't give me something that um, I don't need, but you don't give it to someone sitting next to me when they need it, that's unfair, right? I don't need a prosthetic arm. My colleague does need a prosthetic arm. Uh, it would be a problem if we didn't in our medical, with our medical care, give her the prosthetic arm, but I'm not gonna be upset that I'm not getting one either. We also have um, some, in human cultures, some resources that we think we shouldn't be distributing equally to individuals. So some resources are very private and personal. Um, we're not going to sh freely share our toothbrushes, for example. No one's going to get upset because I'm not going to share my toothbrush with you. And so there are these normative constraints in human cultures about what we do share, how we share, what the right distribution is going to be. And all of these are based on the specific norms of the human cultures. So when we're looking at fairness in non-human species, it's so important for us to look at what their norms are in these societies to start with. And when you've got captive animals, it's very interesting because the norms are co-constructed with the humans they live with. Right. And in all of these studies, the kind of fairness and inequity aversion is, uh, as Sarah pointed out, it's, it's evoked by working and getting paid for work. And in a natural environment, I don't think any capuchins or chimpanzees are getting paid for anything they do. Right. So this is a, an artifact of, um, of captive living. And so I'm curious about the sort of naturalistic evolutionary explanation for why these sorts of inequity aversions might occur. And it might just be an example of a response to norms that are created in the societies and violations of those norms. So one way of looking at this, um, so I'd be very curious to know if you've, if you've looked at long-term responses to the partners um, so not just the frustration right afterwards, but did it impact relationships? And I know you don't want to impact relationships, so it's going to be really hard to do that. But not just the partners, but also the human who's doing the provisioning. Um, there are these, uh, the, um, uh, you know, even the early Premack and Woodruff um, false belief task. As I understand it, Sarah was picking the wrong answer for the trainers that she didn't like. So there, there's, there's this evidence that, that primates like some of their trainers and don't like some of their trainers. And does this create um, tension between the, the trainer and not? Because they are these powerful individuals who you expect to give everyone food. And are they violating this norm that you've expected, that you've, you've come to create? Um, yeah, those are, those are, that's all I wanna say. Thanks so much. <laughs> so uh, with that, we'll open it up to more questions.
for Sarah's talk itself or the discussion that was just inspired by Kristen, or both. That's a really interesting talk, thank you. Um, I was wondering, you talk a lot about uh, pro-social behavior and cooperation, and, and uh, I was wondering if you saw uh, altruistic behavior within the chimps and the, capu uh, the capuchin, so uh, instances when they would give something to another without expecting reciprocity. Oh, that's a loaded question. <laughs> um, does that come out? Oops. Can't get it up. So depending on how you define altruism, it's really hard to answer that question in the sense that we don't know whether they were expecting anything back or not. But the short answer is we don't, we see lots of generally pro-social behavior. We don't see a lot of high cost pro-social behavior. So we see lots of behaviors where they help individuals. We see lots of behaviors where they um, do things that are services. So they groom or they help another individual get into a tree or they help another individual reach something that they can't reach. Um, there's some fantastic work that's come out of um, Germany in Mike Tomasello's lab um, looking at that. Um, so you see that experimentally. Everyone I know who works with chimps has tons of anecdotes on things that look like that. What we don't see a whole lot of is the really costly sort of altruistic behavior like food sharing. Um, so I mentioned in my talk that we do see more refusals when the individual who gets the grape is paired with somebody who gets a cucumber as compared to someone who also gets a grape we never ever saw food sharing. So in the thousands of trials that I have run, I saw two instances, two or three instances, where the individual who got the grape let the individual who have the cucumber have it. And all of those instances were one particular pair. It was one of the pair housed pairs at Yerkes, which already means that it's a, an atypical social situation. And in every case, um, this requires some background. Chimpanzees' hands aren't shaped like ours. They have very, very, very long fingers and very reduced thumbs because they're brachiators. So you, they, they evolved to swing through the trees. And so they have extreme difficulty picking things up and they can't do this grip like we can. So if, I'm going to use this, it's better. If you, they're picking up a grape, they would not pick it up like this and put it in their mouth. They actually pick it up between their fingers like this and put it in. It's not very efficient and they tend to drop the grapes. And so the cases that I saw were where the subordinate individual was getting the grape and dropped it and the dominant picked it up and ate it and the subordinate didn't stop them. I would not consider that either sharing or altruism. <laughs> um, so even aside from the fact that if I had seen something like that, it would be difficult to know their underlying motivations. We really don't seem to see a lot of it. Um, we also did a study on the ultimatum game at one point. So the ultimatum game, I'm going to give just enough background that anybody who doesn't know it has a prayer following. The ultimatum game is a simple economic game where one individual has an opportunity to choose between, in our case, two distributions. Um, the ch first chimp could choose between a 3-3 distribution of apple slices or a 5-1 distribution of six apple slices. And then the second, and then they chose the token that represented one of those slices, passed it to their partner, and their partner passed it out to the human experimenter. And they could refuse by not passing it out. Neither we nor anyone else who's done ultimatum games with chimpanzees has ever seen any refusals. But what we did see is we compared their choices in that version of the task to one where the, the chooser just chose and passed it directly out to the human. And in that case, they always chose the 5-1 split where they got five apple slices and their partner got one. But when they had to pass it to their partner, they switched to about a 60% preference for the token that gave was a 3-3 split. Um, so again, they certainly changed their behavior. And that implies that they understand the role of their partner. And it implies that they know that their partner has some uh, ability to change the situation. But altruism would be picking the 3-3 from the start. And they didn't do that. <laughs> Can I, uh, can I ask a question sure. about, about that? So the, in a lot of these discussions about altruism and cooperation, food is the item that is <laughs> supposed to be shared. Yeah. And this is why I brought up toothbrushes. Like there are some things that humans just won't share. Don't, you know, I'm, you know sex partners, toothbrushes, maybe the sandwich you have on the bus. Underwear. Uh, underwear. <laughs> like there are a lot of things. It wouldn't work if we tried to use that. Mm -hmm. And so w shouldn't we try something else? Yeah. Like building, like building something 
I don't know about chimpanzees so much, but orangutans are really interested in like manipulating things and building things and opening things. And so some sort of a, a task that requires them both to create something cool or to get somewhere new so that they can explore new habitat, but not food. Food seems like a terrible idea. It probably is. Um, so they don't share much food in the wild. Um, they do share it. From my perspective, it's a little better than it could be because they share it most after cooperative interactions. Like chimpanzees share most food after cooperative hunts um, or after they go raid crops for cultivars. Um, so big, big, uh, big plant, uh, big cultivated crops that they have to steal out of a farmer's field. Um, the reason food is used is purely practical because those of us doing social and cognitive work are doing non-invasive, purely voluntary work and we need to motivate them and we need to motivate them to do multiple trials in a row and so you do that with food. And some things are easy to do. We, I mean, uh, Franz's original study looking at grooming, for instance, you can use grooming. That's a very normal thing that is shared. Um, we are trying to take these tasks outside of the lab and do them in the entire social group. So we're now replicating a lot of these studies with just the whole social group pre present. The problem with that, of course, is you have very little control. So you, we are trying to balance, okay, you can do this in the, you can do this in a very tightly controlled lab situation using food. Now you can do it in a more generalized situation where the whole social group is present. Now you can do it in the wild. I mean, getting back to one of your questions, I think you probably see most of these sorts of behaviors in social interactions, not in food interactions, and that's hard for us to replicate. We can't offer them a mate in return for you know, cooperating. <laughs> um, and for an animal like an orangutan, we can't offer them access to a new area because it's they're too large. I mean, practically, that's that's constraining. So yeah, that's it's. Um, it, it's potentially problematic because we're not using the right metric, but it's what we've got. Mm -hmm. uh, hi. Um, I was wondering if you could elaborate on how the same behavior can be explained by different underlying mechanisms and how you decide on what the underlying mechanisms are in each case. Oh, there it comes. Sure. Um, so, for instance, we have also done a lot of work on another economic game called the assurance game, which is a simple coordination task. So individuals have a choice between two options, and if they choose um, the same high-paying option, they get a great payoff, four grapes or four quarters if you're humans. If they choose the same low-paying option, they get a, uh, a single reward, or if they don't coordinate, one gets paid and the other one doesn't. Um, that's really all you need to understand about the task for what I'm gonna say. So what we find is that across squirrel monkeys, capuchin monkeys, chimpanzees, rhesus monkeys, and humans, um, everybody can find the coordinated outcome. They're all quite good at it and they do it relatively easily. Um, so they can find the coordinated higher paying outcome and once they find it, they stick with it. But what we've got good evidence for is that they're doing it in different ways. So the humans, humans of course, seem to be using, seem to understand it as a strategy, and they seem to be trying to figure out how the game is played. Um, capuchin monkeys seem to simply develop a preference for one of the tokens um, that is worth the the better reward, and they seem to be matching what their partner does. The interesting thing about capuchins is they can't do it if they can't see what their partner is playing. Um, and so even after they've already learned to coordinate on the higher paying option, if you don't let them see what their partner is cho has chosen, then they can no longer match. So there seems to be just a simple matching. Rhesus monkeys can continue to do it after you don't let them see what their partner has gotten, but they still just maintain a preference for the higher paying option. We know that because we had them playing simulated, simulated partners on a computer, and they maintain this preference even when it was no longer in their best interest to do so. Um, and then with the chimpanzees, the chimpanzees actually, the chimpanzees are highly, highly, highly influenced by experience, but the chimpanzees who are experienced at games tend to seem to have an actual strategy. So in their case, they found the um, best payoff. So then we blocked their ability to see what their partner was playing and they maintained it. Um, and so then we gave them a new set of tokens and they were able to find the new strategy again very, very rapidly, implying that they had in mind that there was a strategy they were looking for and they just had to figure out which token was worth which payoff. 
So it just ta- it took us five years to do all that. <laughs> so it's just a matter of continuing. Once you once they show a p- evidence of something, figuring out what the most likely option is and doing an experiment to sh- see whether or not that's the case, and then continuing to follow up until you have evidence for what's what what they seem to be doing. So again, we've got at least four different mechanisms going on in there, but they're all reaching the same outcome. Um, One of the interesting things is capuchins, the ones who seem to be matching and can only do it when they can see what their partners are playing, also live in the smallest, most cohesive social groups of any of the species we've discussed. Um, So often in the wild, their social groups are only 12 to 15 individuals. So there probably hasn't been much selective pressure on them to evolve a strategy where they can remember what's going on outside of being able to see their partner. Whereas rhesus in groups of several hundred and chimpanzees in fission fusion groups, there probably is such selective pressure. One of the uh, themes that Kristen uh, picked up on her discussion point was that context matters. And I know you've thought about this. Um, and one of the things that I couldn't help thinking when you were talking about your work was the, f- the function of body condition as a backdrop. And I know that you must have those data because you take very good care of your animals and you're, you're doing this. Have you factored that in? And to what extent does that impact perceptions of equity and inequity and those sorts of things? Yeah. Um, and you're next, I promise. <laughs> um, I suspect it impacts it immensely. So our guys are on, um, we have them on free feed diets. So they get, they have chow available all the time and they get fruits and vegetables every day at multiple time points today, a day, regardless of what they're doing. So our guys are not hungry. Um, they get great veterinary care. They're in really, really good shape. Um, they, and we don't food deprive for studies. So the only way I can look at how uh, body condition impacts it is um, if we test them first thing in the morning when they haven't had any food since the night before. Um, But even that, I mean, that's, you know, that is typical. They actually, in the wild, they don't eat overnight. Um, So that is a typical level of hunger. Now with capuchins, it's probably not as big of a deal because capuchins don't go through these cycles like orangutans do where they have a period of leanness where they lose a significant proportion of their body weight and then gain it back. But for species like orangutans, it probably makes an enormous difference. Um, I would imagine a hungry animal does not turn down a cucumber, even if they're frustrated. (laughs) So that may be another situation of context where we're getting something different in the lab because our guys have the, they have both the flexibility because they're not struggling for survival and they're not worried about predators and they're not searching for their food and they're very well fed. They also know that they're going to get more food later on in the day. So if you don't want a cucumber fine, something better is probably coming. Um, So I'd just like to, uh, I have a, I'd like to get your thoughts about sort of going back to the food sharing and talking about it in a naturalistic setting. Um, So I work with uh, infant mother stuff. And so food sharing happens a lot in the wild, um, especially with infants, with their mothers, of course, and with other individuals as well. So we see that a lot in wild chimpanzees. I work at Ngogo in Uganda. And, um, And then we also see it in adults, and particularly one weird behavior seems to be that I'm really interested in is sort of pre-masticated food sharing between mothers and infants where mothers sort of end up spitting food out into their infant's mouth after they ask for it, of course. Um, And that sort of then is transferred over into adult lives where we've also seen sort of adult males who are preferred partners, they'll spit food into each other's mouths. And it's not just with meat, it's with just random fruit and stuff like that. And so I've wondered if um, a lot of these adult food sharing behaviors are sort of a a leftover byproduct for the main function being mother-infant, or or at least some of the developmental social stuff that infants have to go through that then gets carried through into adult lives. I wonder if if any of you can comment on... um, on sort of food sharing, how important that might be in early life versus later life. And, you know, even with the capuchins or with um, or mainly the capuchins, if sort of mothers might be more likely to um, show more of this pro-social behavior or even some of the younger guys. Uh, I don't know. I don't have a question, just a thought. Yeah, well, that's actually really interesting. I had not heard that. So um, I would actually like to talk here more about it later. I don't think it's, all, yeah, a lot of it's not published, but I know people are seeing it a lot at different sites, sort of these really pro-social food sharing behaviors that, yeah. Cool. 
Um, capuchins, so mother infants are a big exception to the non, to the, they don't do much active food sharing. So obviously they're mammals. So by definition, mothers are starting out with a lot of food sharing. Um, and capuchins, much like chimpanzees, um, do a lot of food sharing initially. Um, capuchins are born particularly altricial and unusually for a animal of that small body size, they're usually two years between birth events. And so capuchin females are pregnant for six months and will nurse for a year plus. Um, and then they do a lot of food sharing. The other interesting thing about capuchins is that the female uh, phylopatric, which means the females stay in the um, social group into which they were born. And we do see an increase in food sharing among these female friends, which may be a counterpart to what you're talking about with these males at Nagogo. Um, so I, I mean, one possible, one thing that would be really interesting to study is whether that this starts with a mother infant bond and then it is, um, it is, continued among really close social partners. Um, that would be really cool. So at this point, um, we should probably uh, end the question session. Um, but if you have other questions, uh, certainly I'm sure uh, Sarah will be happy to talk to you during this break. Oh. And the questions will continue at the panel at 4 o'clock. <laughs> so once again, um, please join me in thanking Sarah and Kristen.